about you, Popinjay. I've no reason for letting you live either. What a pleasant coincidence. I feel exactly the same way about you, Capitan. You wouldn't care to translate that feeling into action, would you? I might be tempted. Hey folks, I'm Matt Easton of Scholar Gladiatura. I'm a fencing instructor and antique sword dealer. And today we're going to analyse one of the most famous duels in movie history, from The Mark of Zorro, 1940, featuring Basil Rathbone and Tyrone Power. Tyrone Power in the titular role of Zorro. Understandably, for its technical brilliance, this duel is held up as an example of movie sword fights, often in the greatest 10 or 20 sword fights of movie history. But there is more to say about it than that, and there are some things to criticise, so we're going to look at that in this video. But before we go on, this video is coming to you without any other ads playing on it, thanks to the sponsorship of Raid Shadow Legends. Raid Shadow Legends is a massively popular turn-based fantasy combat game that you can play on your cell phone or mobile phone or on your PC. One of the things I love about Raid is it's genuinely tactical, actually, and the way you build your team and the way that you develop the skills of your players is very much like a typical role-playing game actually. So just a little tip, I found a really good way to level up my champions is to um, get the sparring pit, or which you have to uh, get to a certain level in order to open, but once you've got it open you can put whichever champions you like into the sparring pit. That does mean that you can't access them for games while they're in the sparring pit, imagine it as a training area, uh, but they're, cons they're just constantly going up in level. Just within the last couple of weeks, they've added a load of new updates. There's a lot to mention, so I'll just dive straight in. First, they've just added champion fragments, which let you collect um, kind of like pieces of champions that you can use to summon specific awesome new champions. And they're going to be special events for those as well. There's also a new bazaar where you can load up on high value items with the gold bars you win in Tag Arena. And they just extended the daily login rewards up to 270 days with free champions available just for logging in. It's been a crazy month for updates, so there's never been a better time to start playing Raid Shadow Legends. You can find me in-game under the name Captain Context, and if you're quick enough, you can even join my clan. So what are you waiting for? Go to the video description below, click on the special links there, and if you're a new player, you'll get 50,000 silver, 50 gems, one energy refill, and one clan boss key, and five mystery shards, and a day XP booster, plus one free epic champion, the Shaman. You can get all of these rewards up here in the treasure chest. Now back to the main video, thanks for staying with us. Now to put this movie fight into context, a little bit of background. Tyrone Power plays Don Diego Vega, otherwise known as Zorro. Basil Rathbone plays Captain Esteban Pascual. Now, they were both around, uh, these characters were around, in, the, uh, in California uh, during the period of Mexican rule, that is 1821 to 1846. And that's important if we're going to analyse the equipment uh, in this fight and the way that they're fighting. Now, for anybody who is a fan of swords and knows about swords, one of the first things you'll notice about this movie fight, and this is something which is common of lots of movies, actually, of the first half of the uh, 20th century, is that they're not using the swords that are appropriate to that period. So we're talking about the kind of second, third um, decades, perhaps fourth decade, of the 19th century. So what swords should they have been using? Well, uh, there are three main options at this time. First of all, there is the military sabre. So they could have been using military sabres, either for infantry officers or uh, cavalry sabres. They're both types of military sword that were popular at that time. The second type of sword they may have used and could have been using this period is a small sword. And the small sword is the kind of official dueling sword of this period. There is a sword that sits between these two, known as a spadroon, uh, which has a hilt which looks very much like the small sword, but with a, a blade that has the ability to cut as well as thrust. Um, the other option which you could have found, particularly in the Mexican sphere at this date, is still the cup-hilted rapier. Now, the cup-hilted rapier is something which is more associated with the um, 17th century, but they were still being used for dueling purposes um, in the early 19th century. Um, and, but what do they actually use? Well, the, what they're actually using are these. 
And you might think, but Matt, surely that is a sabre, isn't it? Or is it a rapier? What is it? So no, this is just a modern sport fencing sabre. And these, at least in this form, and this narrow, and this light and whippy, and these are incredibly quick and whippy and light things. Uh, these only really come about after about 1900, 1910. So these weapons essentially are married to the modern Olympic movement. What was being used before 1900 was uh, a weapon which weighed on average two to 300 grams more than this. These only weigh about 400 grams. Usually the types of sometimes known as gymnasium sabers around before that were more like six, seven hundred grams minimum uh, in most cases and in some cases up to eight or nine hundred grams. So quite simply the swords that they're using in this fight are not the swords that the historical, uh, the imaginary historical characters would have been using in the early 19th century. They're actually sport saber, Olympic style sabers um, that people were using in the Olympics at the time of the movie in 1940. So without further ado, let's actually get into the fight and break down some of the details in it. What's good, what's bad? Quiet you, Poppin' Jay. I've no reason to letting you live either. What a pleasant coincidence. I feel exactly the same way about you, Capitan. You wouldn't care to translate that feeling into action, would you? I might be tempted. If I had a weapon. Would you? Oh, no, please, gentlemen. No, this is going much too far. It's only to serve you, Excellency. Huh. You have a champion, Luis. And what a champion. Now, gentlemen. Diego. Mr. Van Stefan. I'll make it short and save you fatigue. <laughs> ah yes, cutting candles. Well, of course, the problem is a uh, sport fencing saber, as shown in the um, in the movie fight, wouldn't be able to cut candles, at least not uh, cleanly. You might snap the candle off. Uh, but there we go. It is what it is. It's a nice little effect for the screen. Now the first thing we have to say about this fight and is common to most movie fights of any period of any genre is that usually they're conducted out of distance. Uh, that is the two people when they're giving their blows with their, um, with their sabers they're not actually in distance to be able to hit each other unless they lunged and that's one of the issues here is that generally speaking this style of fencing which is essentially what they're doing is a late form of um, saber fencing they are not lunging with attacks and lunging that is extending the, the uh, right foot or lead foot forwards at the same time as the attack and stretching out the rear leg is what enables you to cover distance to hit the opponent you don't just stand in distance and just exchange blows and you'll notice when they are just exchanging blows they're their blows, if they weren't parried, are not close enough to the body to actually hit either of the people. So essentially what they're doing is they're doing lots of very fast, complex, wonderfully remembered and very accurate movements, commendable, but none of those movements are in distance to actually hit the other person um, and they're just doing everything from out of range. Here you can really see that there's no lunging going on. They're literally just standing there in an on-guard stance, uh, moving their swords really, really quickly in a set of very excellently choreographed, very impressive, very fast movements. But there's no attempt to cover the distance with a lunge or even a gather step in order to actually hit the other person. That's the Capitan. Get out, get out. The <laughs> 
We see that the filmmakers to overcome this aspect of the choreographed fight, i.e. the lack of lunging and the fact that they are doing everything out of distance, often films um, down the line as it were, so that you have the two uh, protagonists uh, looking at one from behind one and towards the other such that you're hiding the distance between them. We don't usually see the people uh, from the side like this because then you can see that their swords are just doing this and they're not actually coming in with the distance to hit each other but instead if you film them like this then all of these movements look more threatening and more impressive to the viewer because they look like they're aimed at the opponent. It's also notable that occasionally they do lunge uh, and sometimes they lunge and forget to uh, retreat again, they uh, forget to recover from the lunge and they stay on the lunge and give a whole set more movements because they're doing a lot of sword movements and not very much foot movement in general. Um, but additionally you'll notice that when they want to hit a piece of scenery uh, such as lunging into a, uh, a wall or whatever then they do lunge because they have to be able to reach the scenery and that's the big difference we can see here between when they are trying to hit something, a piece of scenery, or when they're not trying to hit something, the other person, the other actor. And so they use the lunge when they're trying to hit, but when they're not really trying to hit, they don't use the lunge. The fencing master has met his equal. <laughs> careful, careful! Are you tiring, Diego? Oh, Excellency, I'll take you on in a moment. Some of these disengages, parries and responses and reposts are really complex and really, really accomplished. And I can't, um, I can't underemphasize how impressive the, uh, the, pra the learning, the repertoire that they've learned and the choreography that they have practiced and the tightness of the movements are super, super impressive in this fight. Ah, uh, the dramatic face-to-face -face bind like this. And this is used in so many movies, everything from uh, the 1920s and 30s all the way up to um, Star Wars, for example, with lightsabers and everything else. It's used in lots of movies where the two fighters, they cross their weapons, come close, and they exchange some dialogue. Um, now this in itself isn't a problem. This can happen, this does happen in fencing, historical swordsmanship, with whatever type of sword. It could be a big two-handed sword, could be a small sword, whatever. It does happen. The problem is how they come out of it. And in invariably, and as we see here, they kind of spring apart and then go back to fencing at distance again. Now in reality, when you're this close to a person, yes, you can sometimes spring apart, but there are so many things that can happen at this distance, including coming around and hitting the person with the pommel, including grabbing the other person's um, sword, you could grab their blade, you could grab their hilt, you could grab their arm or wrist, or indeed punching them. You're not punching distance, or kneeing, or kicking, or wrestling, grappling, um, or just using the blade. And so from distance, instead of springing apart to then carry on at distance fencing again, from here you can very easily hit the person this side with the blade just by altering the angle of the sword, or you can come around to the other side or cut underneath, or re-angle the point and stab in. So there's a whole bunch of different things you can do from this distance. But it's almost never done. In movies they always bind up really, really close. They talk, there's a close-in with the camera so you can get nice, the close-in on the faces and their dialogue and the emotion and the acting. And then they spring apart and go back to typical fencing again. I have to admit that in this particular phrase of the fight, the distance issue seems to be less of a problem, and they seem to actually be cutting and thrusting in closer distance, in a distance whereby the cuts and thrusts would actually land if the parries weren't put in. I'm not sure exactly why this is the case in this part of the fight when it wasn't in the earlier part of the fight. I'm sure some fencers out there might argue that a lot of the out of distance stuff formerly was just feeling out the blade, looking for openings, this kind of stuff, which is a valid comment. Uh, but I do I think generally 
Um, this type of uh, movie fight from this kind of period is pretty much always out of distance and this shows that as a typical example. But in this particular part of the fight that we've just seen and the bit that comes just after this as well, they do seem to have done a much better effort of actually putting the fighters in close distance. And I think part of this might be because they are swooshing the sword over the um, opponent's head some of the time or they're hitting bits of scenery which are around the opponent. So kudos there for that period. They've done a really good job of this part of the fight of actually showing something that looks more like a fight and is that is in more of a correct fighting distance. Ah, the captain's blade is not so firm. It's still firm enough to run you through. I needed that scratch to awaken me. So to conclude, Tyrone Power, but particularly Basil Rathbone, were very, very skilled movie swordsman. Um, Basil Rathbone himself had a background as an actual fencer and he won the British Army fencing championships twice and legend has it that he also instructed on a private um, so personal level he instructed both uh, Errol Flynn and Tyrone Power to improve their stage fencing skills. So not to undermine what the actors achieve in this movie it is an incredibly incredibly impressive feat that they managed to remember so many moves. I myself have, uh, I've taught uh, actors at the Globe and I have done some um, sort of uh, stage and screen choreography stuff and it's really really difficult. It's like remembering lines. It's amazing to be able to remember all of this stuff um, and it's hugely impressive and of course it's very physical as well. It's very athletic to be able to then replicate all of this movement on screen so impressively. But what we mustn't do is confuse what's shown here with real historical combat. It's very, very different, even to a duel, uh, very, very different. And the fundamental things that I've spoken about here, for example, distance being one of the main things, the fact that they're practically always out of distance. Uh, they only really commit to a lunge when they're trying to hit a piece of scenery for dramatic effect. Um, it, it's not, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't relate to real historical swordsmanship and we have to point out it's a little bit disappointing that they didn't use the correct type of sword uh, for the period that this is set in. Uh, they shouldn't really have been using Olympic uh, sport fencing sabres circa, uh, circa 1940. They should have been using early 1800 swords, perhaps a military sabre, perhaps a small sword or a spadroon, or maybe a cup-hilted rapier at least, which I think goes quite well with the Zorro kind of uh, genre and the background of that character. Um, but nevertheless, the style of fencing that they do is based very much on Olympic sabre fencing of the time, but simply without the lunges done with the attacks and with the distance pulled apart and with some of the camera work to try and make up for that to in inject some kind of threat um, but I do want to say once again to reiterate that the the acting and the tension and the accomplishment the physical accomplishment of what is shown in this duel is incredible and I don't want you to think that I'm slating this or anything like this but we have to remember that a lot of the flaws we can criticize in this movie fight is common to other ones as well. It's not specific to this one. There are most movie fights on camera fall into all of these same traps. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. I hope this has been um, enjoyable and fun for you. And uh, give us a like and a subscribe. And I will see you for some more movie and TV fight reviews really soon, hopefully. Take care, folks.